Since the early 1970s, Al Di Miola has been one of the most popular and influential guitarists in the world. From his early years with Chick Corea, his historic performances with John McLaughlin and Paco De La Chia, to his current exploits with his groups Al Di Miola Project and World Symphonia, Al Di Miola continues to be an innovative leader in acoustic and electric jazz fusion guitar. In this video, we'll meet Al and get a close-up look into his playing style and technique, along with personal thoughts on improvising, learning, and practicing. We'll also see Al perform many of his fine compositions, some which have been double-tracked, feature Al playing both the rhythm and lead parts. Hi, I'm Aldi Miola, and welcome to my video. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of different uh, techniques that I use with right hand and left hand, uh, scales and picking patterns. Um, there's many different examples and tunes, uh, also some new tunes that will demonstrate a lot of that. Uh, so before we get started, I want to give you a, t a note to tune up to. Uh, I'll give you an A, although some of the pieces might vary a little bit, but this is a general uh, tone right here that we should work on most of the pieces. I started playing guitar in, uh, where I grew up in New Jersey, uh, in my hometown. Uh, I began taking lessons at the age of eight years old from uh, a great teacher who uh, is, is still teaching today, uh, also still living in New Jersey. His name is Bob Eslanian. And uh, both he and I uh, wrote the book Chord Scales and Arpeggios uh, as well. Um, so it's been quite a while that I've been playing. And uh, he was very much uh, into jazz and the theory, the teaching of the theory of jazz uh, in the very beginning. Although my heart wasn't quite there yet at that age, uh, I got a good foundation and uh, early basic training and, and theory uh, and sight reading uh, from him. I continued on with him for several years, and of course I learned a lot on my own just from listening to a lot of music records and going to concerts later on. Uh, I then went to Berklee School of Music in Boston, which uh, was uh, very inspiring at the time. There were, uh, in and around the school, there were a lot of jazz clubs, and I would just check everybody out. A lot of jam sessions, um, keeping my ears open to a lot of new ideas. And, uh, I got a lot out of that before I got the gig uh, with Chick Corea, and then everything happened from there. <laughs> In this section, Al demonstrates improvising over chord changes, beginning with a basic diatonic progression, followed by his approach to soloing over dominant seventh and diminished chords. In a simplified chord scale, uh, such as a C major 7, progressing to a D minor 7, to an E minor 7, to an F major 7, G7, A minor, D minor 7, flat 5, back to the C major 7. <clears throat> In this case, uh, the C major scale will relate to all. Uh, my choice would be to play on each chord, but I'm going to give you uh, an example of playing both ways and show you the difference. Uh, first we'll start uh, 
by hearing each chord, and I'll play only in a C major scale, so playing no sharps and flats, uh, but thinking of mainly a C scale. And then we'll show the other example after that. So let's, let's begin with that first. So that's basically using, uh, or just me thinking mostly of a C major scale. Uh, now, like I said before, my choice would be to play on each chord, I think, if, if I saw the chart. Uh, and then you'll hear how I add sometimes like a G sharp to, um, when I come to like a G7 dominant chord, I'll, I'll add in the flat nine, uh, or, or even on the last chord of the diatonic uh, chord movement. Uh, which would be the B minus 7 flat 5, I'll use also a G sharp in a scale. I think sometimes these out notes uh, colorize a little bit better. So let's give a little example of that. <laughs> C major 7 chord, I would probably have two choices, one of which would be a, a major, just a plain major, Ionian scale, or a Lydian scale, which is preferable, I think, because you have the passing tone being the F sharp. So more often when you see a major 7 chord, uh, I think a Lydian scale may work, depending on the melody. minor scale is basically that F minor scale, um, which everybody seems to know. I would use scales where uh, I don't so much think of modes, although we can use it as a basis, but um, primarily I like to target the third or the seventh, uh, or at least uh, the important intervals in the chord. Finish a phrase on an important note rather than a sixth or a fourth. Now the same thing for the for the E minor. We just use a minor scale for that. Now sometimes on an E minor seventh or, or any kind of minor chord, I'll play a, a major seventh. Uh, in the improvisation. You'll probably hear me playing a lot in my improvised solos, uh, major seven uh, to a minor chord, or sometimes even a flat second. that. 
I like these inharmonic sounds. So there's a lot you can do. I like weaving in and out of the scale. Uh, sometimes going out of the harmony. So if we, again, we're up to uh, an F major seventh chord, which I think we can use that Lydian scale again, which is an option. Next chord would be like a G7 dominant which when I see a chord like this, I usually add in a sharp five. Um, and I would probably use a whole tone scale there or a scale similar to this. And then the next degree would be a minor chord again. Seven flat five. We could think of Locrian. I mean, I don't think of modes that much, but it's basically what you want to do is start with that and then spin off and create your own thing. And then, of course, you can go outside the chord scale uh, a little bit, uh, chord structure, uh, which I like to try. Let's try it again uh, this time, and I'm going to play some chromatics within this. Also, with the dominant chords, dominant seven chords, you you have diminished chords that relate to the same chord. So we have a seventh, a G seventh. You also have a D diminished. Okay, and you can play diminished lines, or you can play uh, dominant lines, or whole tone scales, depending on. Uh, if you have a flat nine and a chord or a sharp five. As in this example, I'm going to play a run that is sort of a diminished kind of run that works over both the dominant seventh and the D diminished. Here it is. Here's the same line played very slow.
Also works over E7 with a sharp nine, or just E7, or with a flat nine. It's your choice. Same with all of these chords relate going up or down a minor third. So there is a definite relationship between diminished chords and, and seventh chords. Here's another example of a line that could be used over diminished or seventh chord. Uh, in this instance, uh, let's take a G diminished seventh. Okay, there's a lot of experimenting that I do uh, when I'm improvising. A lot of it's, you know, how I feel at the given moment. So sometimes I don't know exactly where I'm going, but that's that's where uh, hopefully magic will happen in, in your improvised solo. Um, it's, it's how you weave back in to uh, a logical uh, pattern that relates to the intervals in the chord, uh, the key intervals being your third and your seventh primarily, sometimes your fifth. But um, a lot of it's your ear and how you feel. Um, but I do like to experiment a lot. I don't like to play the same exact patterns. Um, playing chromatic uh, notes outside of the uh, chords, sometimes playing a different scale altogether, and then weaving right back into the, the harmony again is interesting. Um, I never know what's going to happen when I'm soloing uh, exactly, because it never comes out twice the same. Uh, so for now, why don't we just hear what a G7 chord is, and I would recommend uh, that either a sharp 5 or a flat 9 be played so that um, uh, it'll make more sense when you hear what I'm playing. Okay? <laughs> So that's a little bit on the G7. And depending on uh, the rhythmic variation that's happening uh, uh, with your uh, rhythm section, whatever they're providing, that's going to determine where you're going to go. And of course, more chords will be, uh, uh, will also inspire a different direction. Um, but I think when you're vamping on one chord, which is uh, the case in uh, you know, a lot of forms of music, you have a a long series of bars where you have to try to do something interesting. Um, I think that uh, rhythmic variation plays a real big part, and we'll be getting into that uh, pretty soon, too. Here's a little vamp now that uh, comprises uh, starting with a minor chord, going to a diminished chord. Uh, a third chord would be like a major seven, and then to a dominant seven, sharp nine. So it goes through different types of scales. And I'll show what I play over this sequence. Two, three.
Aldi Miola's total command of the instrument is demonstrated by his ability to play both in vertical and horizontal positions on the fingerboard, sometimes even playing complete passages on only one string. This is an example of how I would uh, try to break the habit of playing in positions. Uh, and this is just an exercise of playing on one string at a time. Uh, so if I were to pick, say, like a G minor chord right now, uh, I would play on the, the E string uh, as melodically as I could in, uh, in a G minor scale to, to learn the whole neck. Get used to playing the whole neck. It sort of gets you out of the habit of playing in position. So let's try a little bit like that. Now, going to the second string, let's try the same thing just for a brief moment so we can get used to doing that kind of thing. Go ahead. Anyway, there's a lot that you can do even on one string. And uh, hopefully, uh, when you practice something like that, it'll get you out of the habit of playing in positions. It's really a good idea to learn um, scale uh, intervals in relation to chords so that when you're soloing, you can target uh, certain key points like a third or a seventh. Um, primarily, and not just guess where you're going. Uh, so when I'm thinking of, say, the G minor chord, for instance, um, I actually look at the, the fretboard, and, I, and I, I pretty much know where all of my Fs are and where all my B flats are. Uh, so I'm, I'm targeting them at some times and within the solo. Uh, so I think that's a real important thing. Aldi Miola has long been admired by guitarists for his tremendous right hand picking technique. Now, let's take a close up look at how Al plays single note lines using alternate picking and right hand muting. But first, let's watch Al perform a tune from the album World Symphonia entitled La Stream.
In regard to picking technique, right hand picking technique, again, I, 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 I want to emphasize the, the importance of playing the notes, playing the guitar. And, and um, without sounding like I'm, I'm preaching that this has got to be the way, um, I really feel that you have a much better effect in the long run uh, to stay away from sweep picking and, and hammer-ons. So, you know, the overemphasis of that is um, not going to be good in the long run for more intricate kinds of music. Um, so I would just, you know, try to develop the right hand as much as possible and, and avoid the shortcuts. And I, I really feel that sweep picking and hammer-ons are a shortcut and uh, less effective in the long run. So uh, hopefully in this video there'll be enough of uh, demonstrations of how you can develop the right hand uh, to free you up and play some more intricate music as you progress on the instrument. <laughs> And that kind of thing um, is an example of me muting again, uh, which will cause the notes to pop out. So your articulation when playing lines like that is very important, especially when playing with a group and you have to pierce through the drums and the bass and the, the keyboards. Um, that's always been real effective for me to do that kind of phrasing, you know. And you have the option, of course. But uh, I, I stay away from the approach of picking a note and hammering on. I prefer to pick notes. Here's another example of uh, an exercise developing right hand uh, using triplets. And uh, again, we'll take the triplets down in tempo, so we'll lower the quarter note as much as possible, and then I'm going to speed up the quarter note and maybe come back down again. And the thing to achieve here is evenness. Um, and this is an alternate picking style, so um, you have to get used to doing that kind of thing. And here I'm accenting the one. Let me slow it down a little. Anyway, that's what you want to try to achieve. And to start slow, obviously. Again, the right hand, very important. Uh, no movement from the elbow. Movements in the wrist, OK? Um, if you develop another way of doing it, you probably will not get as much fluidity. Uh, I have never seen anybody play like this, you know, and be able to do that same kind of thing as fluid. So it's important to concentrate more on the, on the wrist action. Alternate pickings, preferable, unless you're playing phrases that uh, are somewhat like this. It's impossible to use an alternate picking style there because it would be awkward to go up, down, up. Now, if I played this real slow, up, down, and to think that you'll be able, in this position, to swing back up and hit the third string which is your B flat in this particular triad, is impossible, especially at a fast tempo. So you want to be able to play uh, passages that require you to play uh, first string, second string, third string in succession, uh, up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down. And that's a picking exercise in itself. It's a very difficult thing to do for guitar players. <laughs> Now, if we were to do the same thing 
say. Same triad. Going down. Starting from the third string this time, which is still starting on the B flat of the third string. D sharp. G. Or in this case, B flat, E flat, G rather. go down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up. So there are times an alternate picking uh, uh, doesn't work as a down, up, down, up kind of motion. And there's an example. And this example is a, a passage from a tune that I recorded on my first album. And um, it was a very, very difficult thing for me to get. So I, I used that as uh, a practice exercise for myself to develop this up, up, down motion. Now, in this particular one, I'm starting with a triad uh, coming up with F sharp, C sharp, G. If you could just try this real slow, this is an exercise. Up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down. this long enough, about this long, you'll notice your hand will probably tighten up right about here. And again, the idea is to play it real evenly. There's another example uh, from a tune called Passion, Grace, and Fire from an album Electric Rendezvous, uh, the duet that I play with uh, Paco de Lucia. That's kind of a tricky phrase. Here's an example of downstrokes uh, on chords, all downstrokes. Except for this last chord. Let's just practice uh, all downstrokes. take it a lot slower so we can get it together.
So you see how I'm relating to the time, and I'm playing against it a lot of the times. It's in, in Latin music, this is called playing against the clave, the clave being the time. And uh, it's, it's very important. A lot of it has to do with feel and everything. It's, you know, whether or not you're, you're able to feel the time and how you relate to the time. So. <laughs> Lot of that feeling uh, when playing these kind of rhythms is an up feeling. It's not a down. I'm not feeling down beats. I'm feeling up beats. Okay. Uh, that's just a general concept. You might not be able to grasp it at first. But I want to try some of the same kind of uh, scalar lines at a slower tempo. So let's take it down about half that. And I'll try some things related to what I just did. Here's a triplet phrase that I, I examined and shown an example of in my book, uh, Picking Technique book. album World Symphonia demonstrates one of Al's true strengths on the guitar, his ability to pick fast, smooth, arpeggiated chordal passages.
Let's talk about technique, right hand technique, primarily um, utilizing uh, the wrist instead of the forearm, um, trying to get as much movement happening in this area. I pretty much, when I pick, uh, most of the time I have my palm rested on the bridge, which is important. Uh, and I get this kind of motion happening. I don't pick like this. I don't recommend it. Uh, this being a good way to uh, to develop uh, or even get used to doing that because then it's hard to break the habit. But um, try to get that wrist action happening uh, as much as possible. So in this example, which is uh, an excerpt from Orient Blue, a uh, piece that I played already, uh, this will be played a lot slower using this kind of movement. There are times when I come off of the strings and I'll free float the hand. Which is more for the reason of getting a fatter sound when you move away from the bridge. But this is an exercise in itself. There's a, another piece as well that uh, will demonstrate the same kind of thing. And just this little exercise here, without even changing to the next chord is a great way to develop the right hand technique using skips. So going from the open A to the high E, down stroke, up stroke. So I've got the quarter note slowed down to this tempo. Another effective thing that I do a lot of times is I dampen strings. And that's where the palm lying on the bridge is going to become, uh, you know, important ingredient in having that happen. Obviously, if I'm out here, it's difficult. And actually, I just realized by doing that, I could dampen by lowering my pinky onto the string. But this is more effective in having the notes pop out, which is important for articulation.
trill, adding adding in that that those kind of triplet kind of things. Much more control by by anchoring your palm on the bridge uh, if you want to do those kind of rhythms. Coming up, Al talks about rhythm playing, which he draws from his vast influences in jazz, Spanish, and Latin rhythms. Let's first watch as Al fills both roles as a rhythm player and soloist in his composition, Cello y Terra.
In this kind of rhythm playing, uh, it's important to point out what I'm doing here. I think a lot of times I, I use my upstrokes muted. Strokes are muted. So in, in this particular example, I'm going. Obviously, the muting is not happening on the right hand, it's happening on the left. So you have to be, become accustomed to releasing the strings. This hand has to get used to playing the rhythm. I'm going to slow it down a little bit more so you can see it better. Rhythm is percussion, and that's the way I use the guitar a lot of the times, whether it be rhythm playing or solo playing. This is an example using double stops uh, in a particular piece.
this particular piece was uh, uh, composed with the idea of percussion going on behind me, you know, more of a salsa vein. Uh, so that was the basic inspiration for the, for the lick. Uh, but I think that it's a good exercise for right, left hand rather than right hand control, uh, especially with the double stop. A lot of people ask me about my sound and what I use as far as outboard effect. Um, there are two pieces of equipment in particular that I use with my acoustic guitar primarily. And uh, this one reverb unit, which is a Lexicon 200, uh, I utilize two different settings. One's a long concert hall, one's a short concert hall. And the short I would use mostly for rhythm playing if I'm. Uh, long phrases, I like to have a much longer. So anything that's played kind of slow, on the slow side, I will use a long delay. Uh, anything that's played real quick, it's better to clean up the sound a little bit and go to the shorter reverb time. Uh, the other unit that I use is a stereo chorus. Uh, this is a TC stereo chorus unit, and I utilize a, a certain setting here that works for me real well. So together, this is the all I'll use with the acoustic guitar most of the time. Uh, with my electric equipment, when I'm playing electric, uh, I've been using a Paul Reed Smith guitar. Uh, I have several of those models of guitars, some of which have DiMarzio pickups, some don't. And um, I have several different amplifiers. Um, I've been using uh, Boogie in the past and Marshall in the past. Depends on uh, the type of music that I'm playing at the time. Uh, but I've been mostly using my old uh, 1958 Gibson 175, which has been used through bag end speakers. Uh, very good monitor system uh, from a company in Illinois. Uh, and also uh, the amplification for that, I've been using a Perot amp, which is made in New Zealand. Um, and the same thing with that, I, I also use the Lexicon Reverb with that particular setup, uh, with the 175, and also the TC Chorus works at times as well. In addition to my Ovation guitars, which I've been using for many, many years now, uh, I have a custom uh, classical guitar that I've been using and will be on, uh, used on the new album as well. And this is made by Abe Wechter, who is... Uh, a really good luthier in Michigan, who also makes guitars for John McLaughlin and a number of other guitarists uh, on the scene. Before I say goodbye, I just want to uh, also point out that a lot of the examples that I've used in this video uh, are found, uh, or other examples as well, are found in uh, two books in particular that I have out, um, Guide to Chord Scales and Arpeggios, and also the Picking Techniques book, Volume 1. There, there will be a Volume 2 coming out. Um, and some of the, the actual music is in a book called Cello e Tetta from the album Cello e Tetta. Uh, but I want to thank you for watching. Take care.
Thank you. 